right. Let's see. Is this recording? Yeah, I think this is recording. Okay. Uh, so while. Um, okay. So. I, uh, so maybe um, we can start uh, with uh, just uh, a few administrative uh, comments. Um, so first, I just have a, a question for all of you guys. Uh, would anyone mind if I brought my dog to class? Uh, I know that not everyone loves. What's that? Okay. I know that not everyone. Not uh, yeah. I, I mean, I imagine most of you would never follow. But if you do have a problem with my bringing my dog to class, let me know. Because uh, you know, uh, not everyone loves dogs. I mean, um, I can't imagine why. But I know some famous physicists who don't love dogs. So, uh, if you would object to my bringing my dog to class, let me know. Um, otherwise, uh, maybe I'll bring them along next time. Um, what was the other administrative comment? Okay. Uh, oh yeah. Um, it's so I have the uh, second problem set uh, up here. It's already also posted on the website. Um, it will be due next Monday. Um, perhaps now is a good chance uh, for us to discuss uh, just some administrative details of the class uh, for the rest of the semester. Um, so uh, today is, uh, I don't know, sometime, it's sometime in January, I know that. It's like the 19th or something like that. Is that about right? 18th? Yeah. Something like that. Okay. Um, yeah, I think it's the 19th. So that means that you will have a problem set due uh, the 25th, uh, February uh, 1st, I think, and February 8th. And that, along with the problems that you just uh, handed in will sort of be the first half of the material which will be covered by the midterm. And so I would like to schedule the midterm for some time after that fourth problem set is due on February 8th. Um, so the two possibilities are um, February 11th, which is a Thursday, or uh, 16th which is a Tuesday. Um, so the 16th is the Tuesday before spring break. Um, so uh, the 11th would be the Thursday uh, one week before spring break. Or I guess it's probably not justified to call it spring break here. Um, so are there any strong preferences? Like, do you guys have other midterms scheduled around then? I would hate to schedule something on the same day that you have another midterm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so uh, there are advantages and disadvantages to both dates. Um, if we have it on the 11th, uh, that means that we have a full week after the midterm before spring break, which is enough time for me to dive into uh, more material. Um, on the other hand, if we have it. On the 16th, you know, after that, you only have one more class before spring break, and it's sort of hard to start a new topic uh, the la the cl on a class between the exam and spring break. So my preference would be for the 11th. Uh, the one uh, mild disadvantage is that that means that you would have a problem set due the Monday of that week and then a midterm the following uh, Thursday. Um, I think that's not such a big problem because the problem set will help you study for the midterm uh, and so it'll just be a classical mechanics heavy week uh, but that of course is an advantage uh, rather than a disadvantage um, and uh, in, in, in recompense uh, for giving you the midterm on uh, that week I would of course not have a problem set due the following Monday um, so in either case there will not be a problem set due on Monday the 15th yes uh, Uh, that is that is true. Uh, what's that? Yeah, generally speaking, I've been trying to pressure the TAs into giving the problem sets back a, a week within a week. Um, yeah, um, that's a that's a reasonable point. That's a that's a reasonable point. Um, so yeah, I don't really care. I mean, which date it is, the 11th or the 16th. Um, Let's take a vote because uh, this is a um, autocracy uh, with uh, a veneer of democracy. So uh, let's take a vote. Who would prefer to have it on the 11th? 
Okay, two, who, three, who would four, who would prefer to have on the 16th? Okay, let's, let's do it on the 16th then. So the midterm will be on February 16th. See, I let you guys decide things which are of no consequence, um, <laughs> but I make all of the important decisions. So the midterm will be on February 16th. Um, yeah, the midterm will be on February 16th. Um, it will be in class, so it will be one hour, 20 minutes. Um, so it will be, let's see, 680 minutes. Um, it will be a closed book, no notes, uh, no books, no cell phones, no uh, Ouija boards, no other sources of outside information. Um, there aren't that many formulas you have to memorize, so that's why I don't really necessarily uh, feel like you need to have uh, notes or anything like that. Yes, there was a question. Is there any way we can get another group rather than having... Yes. Yes. I, I, will, I will find uh, a room. Uh, I will book the bell room or something like that. I'll, I'll find a room for that class, which is quiet. Um, also, probably slightly larger, so you can spread out a little bit. Um, okay, you, your job is to email me to remind me. To do that. <laughs> and if I don't do it, it's your fault. So blame him if I forget to do that. Um, okay, good. Um, any other questions of an administrative uh, nature uh, before we go do some physics? Good. Um, okay, so last time uh, we began our discussion of oscillators. So just to remind you, um, if we consider a 1D system, a system with one degree of freedom, uh, Q and a Lagrangian, which is a function of Q and Q dot, then an equilibrium uh, is a, at a value of Q, say Q naught, such that uh, the derivative of the potential vanishes at this particular value of Q. Uh, so uh, schematically, you could imagine your potential as some function of Q and then the equilibria will be places where the derivative vanishes. And near such an equilibrium, uh, we can expand the Lagrangian in small fluctuations around that equilibrium. Uh, this is what we did at the end of class last time. And we found that the dynamics is that of a simple harmonic oscillator. So in particular, uh, if we set our equilibrium point to be at Q equals zero, then the equation of motion for the simple harmonic oscillator is given by Q double dot plus omega squared Q was equal to zero. Where omega was a number that uh, essentially parametrizes uh, the curvature or the second derivative of this potential around one of the uh, minima and um, it physically tells us about the frequency of the oscillation. So omega squared was the frequency, or the square of the frequency of the oscillation. Uh, so for example, for an unstable extra, for an unstable equilibrium, um, Omega was imaginary, and the solutions to this equation of motion uh, were exponentials, 
So the solution was a linear combination of two exponentials, e to the plus omega t and e to the minus the magnitude of omega t. Uh, more interesting, however, is the case where omega is real, in which case the solution was a linear combination of sines and cosines, uh, which we would write as sine omega t and cosine omega t. And I emphasized that whereas in your previous mechanics classes you thought about oscillators uh, as uh, masses on springs uh, that were bouncing around, in fact, the real reason why we are interested in oscillators is that every damn system near an equilibrium point is an oscillator, uh, with some small exceptions. Um, so before continuing, um, I would just like to make a, a few comments about um, about um, the equation of motion of the simple harmonic oscillator. So the equation of motion of the simple harmonic oscillator, q double dot plus omega squared q equals zero, uh, has two uh, very special properties. Um, so the first property is that this is a linear uh, differential equation. So that means that all of the terms in the differential equation uh, are uh, linear in Q or its time derivatives. And you hopefully remember from your differential equations class that the solutions of a linear differential equation have the property that if you take two solutions, you can add them together to get another solution. So the sum of two solutions is also a solution. That's why if we observe that both sine omega t and cosine omega t are solutions to the differential equation, then uh, sine omega t plus cosine omega t is also a solution to the differential equation. And likewise, um, if you take any solution to the differential equation and multiply it by a constant, it is still a solution to the differential equation. So a constant multiple of a solution is also a solution. Systems whose equations of motion are linear are very, very easy to study compared to those which are nonlinear. Um, in your uh, lives as physicists, you have probably uh, been under the impression that most differential equations you write down have exact analytic uh, solutions, uh, sines, cosines, and so forth. That, uh, of course, is just a fiction. Um, it is only because you've been studying very simple and largely uh, linear systems uh, that you have encountered systems whose solutions are only very, very simple functions. And so uh, for the time being, uh, for the rest of this lecture at least, um, I will consider only variations on the simple harmonic oscillator uh, where the equations of motion are linear. Um, but later in the course, uh, we will uh, spend a lot of time studying systems which are nonlinear and that, of course, is where life uh, gets substantially more interesting. Um, okay, uh, are there any questions uh, before I continue? Okay. So, um, as I mentioned, the general solution is a linear combination of sines and cosines. Um, it's typical to write uh, the general solution uh, rather than as a sine plus a cosine, but instead we can write it 
as uh, a constant times sine omega t minus phi. So this is just using one of our favorite trigonometric identities um, to rewrite that second term, b cosine omega t, as a shift in t of the first, uh, the first solution, sine omega t. And as you hopefully remember from your elementary mechanics classes, um, these two constants, a and phi, uh, have names. This constant a is known as the amplitude of the oscillation. And phi is known as the phase. And once you specify A and phi, um, the solution to the equation of motion is known explicitly. So just to remind you, the equation of motion is a second order differential equation. Thus, two pieces of initial data are required to specify a solution to the equation of motion. Um, I could take these two pieces of data to be the amplitude and the phase in the case of a harmonic oscillator. Uh, more generally, I could take them to be the position and velocity of the oscillator at some given point in time. Uh, question? Okay. So um, <clears throat> let me make uh, one or two other comments. So the first comment is that if I wanted to, I could use units uh, where omega, the frequency, oops, is equal to 1. Uh, why is that? Um, omega has units of inverse time, uh, so 1 over seconds or something like that. But if I wanted to, uh, instead of using... Um, seconds as my uh, unit of time, I could choose some other unit of time so that omega is equal to one. Um, or uh, more explicitly, I could set, I could use a new time coordinate, t prime, which is omega times t, uh, in terms of which q would just be equal to a sine t minus phi t prime minus phi prime, I guess I should call that. And so, for example, if you look in your textbook, all of the equations are written in these units where omega is equal to 1. Um, in my lectures, I would prefer to keep omega uh, explicit rather than using units where I set it equal to 1, uh, just because there are lots of omegas flying around uh, in the theory of oscillators, and so I think it helps keep things a little less confusing uh, if we uh, keep omega explicit in all of our equations. Uh, but I just tell you this because when you're reading the notes um, or the textbook, uh, some of the formulas might look slightly simpler because uh, the text uses units where omega is equal to 1. So that's just um, a little bit of notation. Um, I would like to make a slightly more uh, substantive uh, trick, um, which is in general... Uh, a useful principle uh, for solving linear equations of motion. So if I have a linear differential equation, uh, what I could do is rather than studying real solutions to the equations of motion, I could study complex solutions to the equations of motion. And, sen and then, since the equation of motion is linear, if Q complex is a complex solution to the equations of motion, both the real and imaginary parts of Q complex 
will themselves be solutions. So that just follows from the fact that the equations of motion are linear. If Q complex is a complex solution to the equations of motion, the real part of Q complex is the sum of Q complex and Q complex bar. Um, and so that's the sum of two solutions to the equations of motion. So itself is a solution. And likewise, the imaginary part is also a solution to the equations of motion. So the complex solutions to the equations of motion are even easier to write down than the real solutions to the equations of motion. They're just given by Q is a constant times e to the i omega t. We're here now, A will be a complex constant. So if I wanted to, I could put a, a subscript C there to remind myself that it is complex. And that can be thought of as the complex amplitude of the solution. So for example, um, I could write A complex as A e to the i omega, t, omega phi, where A is the usual amplitude and phi will be the phase shift. Uh, is, that is that clear? You probably have already seen this notation in your uh, uh, previous classes. Yes? Uh, yes, but uh, if I wanted to, I could also consider the complex conjugate solution e to the minus i omega t and uh, then I would have another degree of freedom there. So this is not the, mo yes. So you're correct. Um, that, so a useful trick as well for using these complex solutions is that the compl if Q complex is a solution to the differential equation and the differential equation is real, then the complex conjugate of Q complex is also a solution. So that's, that, that's another, that, that is something that I am implicitly using here in this, in this setup. So you probably have already seen this um, in your uh, previous encounters with oscillators. But the important point here is that this is not just a feature of the simple harmonic oscillator, but it is, is a feature of any linear equation of motion. Any linear differential equation uh, will be more easily treated by looking at complex rather than real solutions to the equations of motion and only taking the real part at the very end. Um, and so this is, in fact, uh, the way that we will be treating oscillations from now on. Um, so this uh, is, has so far just been a basic reminder of things you probably already know about oscillators. What I would now like to do is discuss a few variations on the theme of oscillators. First, I will describe a few words about damped oscillators before moving on to driven oscillators. Now, you guys already probably saw damped and driven oscillators in your previous mechanics classes. Um, so I will uh, be relatively brief, um, but I suspect the treatment that I will give of these will be uh, a little somewhat different than the treatments that you have seen before. I will use techniques to study these uh, which readily generalize to many of the more complicated problems that we'll be studying later in this course. Uh, before I proceed, are there any questions? Okay, good. So let us start by considering the damped oscillator. So, uh, so far in this course, uh, and so far in the problems that you have studied in your problem sets, for example, we have considered only systems or primarily systems which have a Lagrangian formulation. Uh, those are systems where the force is conservative and can be described in terms of a potential. Uh, however, um, there are many systems without a Lagrangian formulation. Um, so uh, an example, perhaps the simplest example of a system without a Lagrangian formulation would be an oscillator uh, which is subject to friction. 
So uh, if you have an oscillator which is subject to friction, um, then that means that you need to add an additional term to the equation of motion which represents uh, the force due to friction. And uh, the simplest model of a friction force is one where the force of friction is proportional to the velocity q dot of the oscillator. So now this is not to say that all friction forces have this form, just to say that this is a particularly simple model for a force of friction, which will be true uh, in some circumstances. So that means that we need to uh, alter the equations of motion to take into account um, this additional friction term. And so that in addition to the usual Q double dot plus omega squared two Q terms in the equations of motion, we need to augment this with a friction term that is proportional to Q dot. And um, I will write that term as omega over Q times Q dot. So this factor of omega over Q is just a conventional way of writing a term that's proportional uh, to Q dot. I have inserted the factor of omega uh, for dimensional reasons. So remember that omega has units of one over time. So with this way of writing the friction force, this quantity Q is dimensionless. And it has a name, uh, which is the quality factor of the oscillator. So um, you probably, I'm sure you've seen uh, these damped oscillators uh, previously uh, in your lives as physicists. Um, so perhaps I can just remind you of what the solutions to this equation of motion look like. So uh, to solve this equation, the easiest way to find this the solutions to this equation is to consider the following uh, ansatz for the solutions. So let's just take Q to be a constant times E to the I alpha T. So with this ansatz, um, you plug this into the equations of motion and you demand that it vanishes. So, so the first term in the equation of motion will just give you minus alpha squared times Q. The second term in the equation of motion will give you omega squared times Q. And the third term will give you I alpha omega over Q times Q. And that all has to be equal to zero. So you can see that the equation of motion then is just some quadratic equation for that constant alpha. So what will the solutions to this quadratic equation look like? Well, there'll be two of them, uh, which are just given by the quadratic uh, formula. So the, let's see, do I remember the quadratic formula? So minus b over 2a. So that's uh, I omega over 2Q uh, plus or minus the square root of B squared uh, minus 4AC over 2A. So A here is minus 1. Uh, so that just gives us an overall minus sign in the square root. And what we get here is omega squared times 1 coming from the 4AC term uh, minus 1 over 4Q squared, 4Q squared, because it's b squared. So these are the uh, two linearly independent solutions to the equations of motion. And we can see here that there are three uh, qualitatively different cases. So uh, any questions uh, before I continue? I think I already, I divided by two, I divided by two already. Didn't I? That's where that one over four 
came from. And there was a 4AC term, which I divided by 2 inside the square root. So let's first consider the case uh, where Q uh, is very small. So in particular, you can see by staring at that square root that if Q is less than a half, that implies that alpha is purely imaginary. And the solutions uh, then look like Q. So alpha will be I times some number. Uh, in fact, you can check that that number is positive. Uh, I won't go through that for you, but you can check it for yourself in just a second. And so the solution to the equation of motion will be a constant times e to the minus the absolute value of alpha plus t plus another constant times e to the minus alpha minus t. And so these solutions decay in time. Uh, and in fact, they decay in time without even ever oscillating. So this would be the case where there is a very strong friction force because the friction term goes like 1 over Q. Q is small, so the friction term will be big. And so this is the case uh, where the friction term is so uh, strong that the system never even gets a chance to oscillate. Uh, and so for that reason, this is known as an overdamped oscillator. The more interesting case is where Q is bigger than a half, in which case uh, alpha has both a real and an imaginary part. And Q is given by, well, there's a damping term. So it was E to the I alpha T. So alpha plus and alpha minus are complex conjugates. So let me just write down the alpha plus term. So there's e to the minus omega t over 2q coming from that first term in alpha plus. And so that is real. And then there is a complex part which oscillates and looks like e to the i omega times the square root of 1 minus 1 over 4q squared times t. And of course, the solutions to the, the real solutions to the equations of motion would be found by taking the real or imaginary part of this expression. And so that would give us either a sine or a cosine of that complex exponential. So um, what does this look like? So this prefactor here, which is real, is just some sort of overall exponential damping. Whereas uh, this complex part will describe some oscillation which takes place uh, in addition to that damping. And uh, the thing to note is that this oscillation takes place at a frequency which is not the frequency of the original oscillator but instead is at some new frequency which is the square root of 1 minus 1 over 4q squared times omega. So that's less than omega. So if in the presence of damping, the system will still oscillate, uh, but with two differences. The first is that the oscillation will die off in time. Here. The first is that the oscillation will die off in time. And the second is that the frequency of the oscillation will be slightly lower than the frequency of the undamped oscillation. So uh, schematically, if I were to graph uh, such an oscillate, such a damped oscillator, it would look something like this. And these oscillators are known as underdamped rather than overdamped. Um, finally, there is a third case where Q is equal to one half. So in that case, you have to uh, think a little harder. Um, the previous uh, solutions of the equations of motion that I wrote down coincide. Alpha plus is equal to alpha minus. Um, and so the equation in this case we say becomes degenerate 
and you have to think a little harder uh, to find another solution to the equation of motion. Um, this is something that you probably did in your uh, differential equations classes. Um, and and uh, I won't go through the details, but you can show that there's another solution to the equation of motion which appears in this degenerate case, uh, which is not an exponential. So we have one exponential, uh, and then there's another term, which is t times an exponential. Um, this is a, a sort of degenerate case, uh, which I won't um, focus too much time on, um, and it goes by the name of critically down. Uh, I assume in your differential equations class you studied, uh, at least uh, in a cursory manner, um, the degenerate solutions of linear differential equations like this. I, am I correct in assuming that? Yeah. Okay, uh, so that's damped oscillators. Um, any questions on that? Uh, damped oscillators are uh, important because they are the first example that we encounter in this class of systems uh, which do not have a Lagrangian formulation. Or I should be a little careful. Um, I, so it actually turns out that these systems do have a Lagrangian formulation, um, but even though they're not conservative. So if you're bored uh, or if you're having trouble sleeping tonight, I encourage you to think and try and find a Lagrangian formulation for the damped oscillator. So, so these systems are not conservative. And in general, a non-conservative system does not have a Lagrangian formulation. But in fact, it turns out that there is a clever way of formulating Lagrangian which gives you the equations of motion I've described above. So um, it's an instructive exercise to try and figure out what that Lagrangian is. So if, 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 you, if you're up for a challenge, I suggest you try and figure it out. It's not too complicated. But however, because these systems are not conservative, then for example, uh, energy is not conserved, um, momentum is not conserved, and so, um, these are sort of the very simplest systems that one can consider uh, uh, where this is the case. Any questions on damped oscillators before I continue? No questions? All right. Um, so the other sort of, um, I should probably, energy is not concerned. So the other interesting variation on the simple harmonic oscillator that is often considered is the driven harmonic oscillator. Um, so in your um, freshman, or U0, I guess they call it, uh, or U whatever it was, say Jeff, uh, mechanics class, um, you surely encountered the prototypical oscillator, which would be a mass attached to a spring. So here, uh, the degree of freedom that one would use to describe the system would be the horizontal position of this mass on the spring. I will choose the origin of my coordinate system so that x equals zero corresponds to the spring at rest. And if I denote the spring constant by k, then uh, the force that is uh, due to this spring is just minus k times x, uh, the displacement away from the position at rest, uh, which will be equal to m x double dot. And so uh, the equation of motion then is x double dot plus k over m times x equals zero, um, which we identify as a simple harmonic oscillator uh, with frequency square root of k over m. And now uh, we ask the question, what happens if I apply a driving force to this oscillator? So what happens if I apply some sort of external force to this system? 
So, in that case, so what does it, so first of all, what would be the Lagrangian formulation of an external driving force? So, uh, although it might surprise you, uh, there actually is a Lagrangian formulation of an external driving force, uh, which is very simple. Um, so, um, if you have an external driving force, um, say m times f of t, then that means that you have a driving potential, which is minus m f of t times x. And so the Lagrangian of the system is just given by the kinetic energy of the oscillator, which is one half m x dot squared minus the potential energy of the simple harmonic oscillator, which is one half k x squared, right? That's the thing that you take the derivative of to get the force k x. And then there will be uh, an additional term, which is proportional to f of t times x, which describes the driving force. And so this is the simplest example of a time-dependent Lagrangian. So, for example, because this Lagrangian has an explicit dependence on time, the Hamiltonian will, be, will not be conserved uh, or in other words, energy will not be conserved. That, of course, uh, makes physical sense because as you drive this oscillator with the external force, you are pumping energy into the system. Any questions before I continue? No questions? Uh, wh why is B equal to that? Well, because the force is the derivative of the potential with respect to X. And so if V is minus MFX, then F is M, the force is minus MF. Uh, that's just how I, okay, if I have a dev driving force m times f of t, I just did that, I just did that so that uh, the equation of motion would have an f rather than m times f. That's just, uh, yeah, I, I didn't mean anything by it. That's just, uh, I'm just putting in a factor of m there in my definition of the function f uh, to make my equation at the end of the day look nice and simple, right? So the equation of motion will then be m x double dot plus kx minus m f is equal to zero. Or um, x double dot plus omega squared x squared is equal to f, which is a function of time. So uh, for a general system, uh, not just a mass on a spring subject to an external driving force, uh, the equation of motion of the driven simple harmonic oscillator is q double dot plus omega squared q is equal to some function of time. I'm sorry. Thank you. So um, we would now like to understand what the solutions to this system look like. Any questions? Any other questions? Any other mistakes that I made? So what do the solutions to the system look like? Well, unlike the previous equation, uh, this is not a linear differential equation. So the sum of two solutions will no longer uh, be a solution. Instead, uh, this is what is known as an inhomogeneous equation of motion. 
the left-hand side of the equation of motion is linear in Q, whereas the right-hand side of the equations of motion is independent of Q. So in your differential equations class, uh, you learned how to solve a, an inhomogeneous uh, differential equation. And the solution is just given by the sum of two terms. If you can find the general solution of the homogeneous differential equation, uh, which is to say the general solution of the linear differential equation with f equals zero, and then find a particular solution to the nonlinear inhomogeneous equation that I've written above, then um, this, th then the most general solution to the this differential equation will be written as the sum of one of these particular solutions uh, with uh, the general homogeneous solution. So here, Q homogeneous is the general solution of the homogeneous equation, Q double dot plus omega squared Q equals zero. And Q particular is any solution to the inhomogeneous equation, Q particular double dot plus omega squared times Q particular is equal to F. So we already know the general solution to the homogeneous equation. I just wrote it down for you five minutes ago. So all we need to do is find a particular solution. So I assume that in your differential equations class, you saw the fact that the solution of an inhomogeneous differential equation is the solution of the corresponding homogeneous equation plus a particular one. Uh, if you did not, I recommend you go back to your textbook on differential equations and look up Picard's theorem. Um, or uh, if you don't want to do that, I recommend you just staring at the equation for between one and two minutes, uh, and then it will become clear. If it takes you more than two minutes, then perhaps you should go uh, look up Picard's theorem. I think it's called Picard's theorem. Is that right? Does anyone remember? I believe it's Picard's theorem. I mean, we can stare at it right now if you like. Okay, there it is up at the top. So let's stare at that. Take a homogeneous solution, uh, which is one uh, that solves the equation with f equals zero, and add it to a particular solution, and you see that you'll get another solution to the equation. Okay. Stared at it long enough? Okay, good. Sometimes the only thing you can do is just stare at equations for a while. Okay, so now the question is, how do we find a particular solution to the equations of motion? There are two uh, time-honored methods uh, for solving uh, this equation. So the first uh, method for solving this differential equation is to guess. That is a, a time-honored uh, uh, and, and, and uh, often a uh, successful way of solving a differential equation like this. Uh, but there is another more systematic way of solving uh, this differential equation, uh, which is using what is known as the method of Green's functions. So uh, how many of you have seen Green's functions in one form or another? You probably have seen them in your electromagnetism class. Okay. Uh, what they did not tell you in your electromagnetism class is that, in fact, the method of a Green's functions is a very, very general technique for solving any uh, inhomogeneous uh, differential equation. Um, in your electromagnetism class, the inhomogeneous differential equation you were looking at was Maxwell's equation in the presence of a charge density or a current density. Um, here, we are looking at the equation of motion of an oscillator in the presence of a driving force. Um, and this is sort of the uh, the Ur example 
of Green's functions. It's the simplest possible example of Green's functions. But again and again throughout your lives as physicists, uh, you will find that when solving an equation of motion of this sort, a linear equation with a driving term, uh, the best way to do that, the most systematic way to do that, is using the method of Green's functions. And so I would just like to now tell you how that works in this particular case. Um, and I believe on the problem set, uh, you will have a chance to apply this uh, in a variety of settings. Uh, any questions before I, can, before I continue? So a Green's function, uh, I guess I should capitalize it because Green was a person, uh, not a color. Um, a Green's function is a function of two parameters, T and T prime. Which solves our inhomogeneous differential equation for a source which is a delta function at T equals T prime. Uh, here, the dot is d by dt rather than d by dt prime. Uh, but of course, uh, you can check for yourselves uh, that a Green's function, that, that the Green's function will also solve a similar differential equation uh, as a function of t prime as well as a function of t. So physically, uh, what is a Green's function? So physically, This Green's function describes the response of an oscillator uh, to a kick, sort of a delta function impulse or a delta function driving force at time t prime. And in particular, uh, one can see that the solution for this Green's function is very easy to write down. Was there a question? So how do we write down a solution to this equation for the Green's function? Well, first of all, g of t and t prime will solve the homogeneous equation everywhere where t is not equal to t prime. And in particular, um, that means that the Green's function can be written as a constant times an exponential, or if we wanted to write it as a real solution, just some constant times sine omega t. So let's write it as a1 times sine omega t minus phi 1 for t less than t prime and a2 times sine omega t minus phi 2 for t greater than t prime. That's just the statement that the driving force, the delta function driving force vanishes when t is not equal to t prime. And because we would like, so now, we would like this Green's function to describe a response of an oscillator to a kick at t is equal to t prime. So that means when t is less than t prime, we should set a1 equals to zero. We want the Green's function to be zero for t less than t prime. That's just a choice of initial conditions for the solution of our homogeneous, inhomogeneous equation for the Green's function. And so that is just a choice uh, we are making uh, to ensure that this Green's function describes the response of 
an oscillator to uh, a delta function kick uh, at t is equal to t prime. So um, by setting a1 is equal to zero, we ensure that the response of the oscillator happens after the kick at t equals t prime. And so for this reason, uh, the resulting Green's function with a1 is equal to zero is known as a causal Green's function. Uh, there are other sorts of Green's functions you can write down, known as a causal Green's functions. Um, they are not particularly useful in the current context, uh, but in other uh, more complicated systems, uh, such as, for example, electromagnetism, uh, these a-causal Green's functions uh, can be useful uh, for a variety of technical reasons. So we would, however, like to just consider um, a solution with a1 is equal to zero. And that means that the Green's function is zero for t less than t prime and is a constant times uh, sine omega t minus phi two uh, for t bigger than t prime. And we would like to solve our equation of motion for the Green's function, which I have written at the top of the page here, um, by demanding two things. So the first thing is that the Green's function should be continuous at t is equal to t prime. So if you stare at that, uh, what does that mean? That means that phi 2 has to be equal to t prime. Because that way, the portion of the Green's function at t bigger than t prime will be equal to 0 at t equals t prime. That's just the statement that the Green's function is continuous. And the other thing we need to do is to ensure that our differential equation is solved. So that g double dot is equal to a delta function at t equals t prime. Uh, or, in other words, g dot uh, is a theta function. You guys have seen the theta function or the heavy side function? Okay. So g dot is a heavy side function, meaning that it in increases discontinuously from 0 to 1 at t equals t prime. So if you stare at that Green's function, at the t bigger than t prime part, then that Green's function is equal to a times sine omega t minus t prime for t bigger than t prime and 0 for t less than t prime. So g dot is equal to a omega times sine omega t minus t prime and zero for t bigger or less than t prime, which at t is equal to t prime, oops, sorry, there's a cosine. Sorry about that. So at t is equal to t prime, that is either a omega if we approach this function from values which are slightly larger than t prime, or zero if we approach this function from values which are slightly less than t prime. So this function discontinuously jumps, and if we demand that it jumps by one, so that its derivative is a delta function, then that means that we need to set a to be equal to one over omega. So the Green's function which describes the response of an oscillator to a kick of unit impulse at t is equal to t prime is one over omega sine omega t minus t prime for t bigger than t prime and zero for t less than t prime. Any questions on that before I continue? What did I set 1 to 0? A1. A1, yes. Um, I set A1 to be equal to 0 because I would like to describe 
the response of an oscillator after a kick at t equals t prime. So if the oscillator is at rest before t is equal to t prime, that corresponds to setting a1 equals zero. If I wanted to study an oscillator which was not initially at rest, but which was already undergoing some motion before the kick, uh, then I would set a1 to be non-zero. And then I would solve it in exactly the same way, just that my matching conditions would be slightly more complicated. Uh, such Green's functions have a name. They're called acausal uh, Green's functions. Um, so here I've discussed causal and acausal Green's functions. Sometimes these go under the name of advanced or retarded Green's functions. Um, in your electromagnetism course, you might have seen uh, that terminology. Any other questions? Yes. Yes. So. G was equal to A times sine omega T minus T prime. So G dot was A omega cosine omega T minus T prime, or zero. And I want G dot to jump discontinuously from zero to one as I move across from T less than T prime to T bigger than T prime. And so setting this guy to be equal to zero and one, set A to be equal to one over omega. Good question. Remember, this is just, you know, the definition of a delta function. It's the thing that is the derivative of the heavy side function, which jumps discontinuously from 0 to 1. Okay, so why did I do this? Nobody knows. Uh, okay, so let me tell you why I did this. So why is the Green's function useful? Well, let me remind you that the Green's function solves the differential equation of an oscillator with a delta function driving force. And the differential equations I am studying are linear, which means that I can add up a bunch of solutions to get other solutions of the linear equation. So in particular, if I have a driving force f of t, which is some more complicated function of t, then I could cons then a particular solution to that will be given by the following. It will be given by the integral from minus infinity to infinity of over a time parameter that I'll call dt prime, that's just the variable I'm integrating over, of f of t prime, g of t, t prime. So morally speaking, uh, why is this equation correct? Morally speaking, I think of the driving force f as a sum of a bunch of delta functions, and then I integrate up uh, that the solution for a delta fu function to get a full particular solution for a general driving force f. Um, so we can check that the Q that I have written is a solution to the equation of motion with a general driving force f. So let's take the second derivative of Q. So that's the integral dt prime f of t prime times the second derivative of g, uh, which, using this equation here, is a delta function, t minus t prime, minus omega squared. Uh, Christ, there's no double dot there. You guys probably knew that already. Um, minus g of t minus t, of t and t prime. So... Uh, the, the first term is the integral of f of t prime times the delta function of t minus t prime, which is f of t. That's another way of defining the delta function. It's the thing that when you integrate it against another function, just gives you that function at time t. And the second term is just omega squared q. Uh, so q... obeys 
the equation of motion of an oscillator in the presence of a driving force. So uh, just to summarize, um, plugging in uh, the equation for the Green's function uh, that I derived earlier, a particular solution to the equation of motion of a driven harmonic oscillator is just the integral of the force times the Green's function, which was 1 over omega sine omega t minus t prime. And the Green's function was 0 only for t larger than t prime. So I need to integrate t prime from minus infinity up to t. So uh, just to recapitulate, um, the way that I should read this equation is that the response of the oscillator to a driving force f of t is found by integrating over all previous times t prime that occur before the time t I'm looking at of the force times this green function g of t which describes the response of an oscillator to the force. And the fact that I can divide my driving force up into little tiny delta functions and then sum over delta functions to get the full answer is a consequence of the fact that I'm studying a linear equation of motion. And if I work, uh, and for nonlinear equations of motion, life gets much more complicated. And uh, it's harder to study uh, the solutions uh, systematically in the way that I have done here. So I've now given you a recipe for finding uh, the general solution uh, to the driven simple harmonic oscillator. You just add this particular solution that I have written here uh, to the general solution of the homogeneous equation that I wrote earlier. Any questions on that before I continue? Yes. The upper limit, well, the upper limit is infinity if I'm integrating against the Green's function. But remember that the Green's function was zero if t is less than t prime. So that's why, uh, so uh, you're right, the upper limit uh, for this expression here was infinity, but I set my Green's function to be equal to zero if t prime is bigger than t. So I only have to integrate it up to t. That's why I chose my Green's function this way. Uh, life would have been more complicated if I'd chosen another one, another one. I would have still gotten the right answer, but you know, uh, you would have to think, and, and nothing's more dangerous than thinking. Uh, other questions, comments? Thoughts? Feelings? So, for any driven harmonic oscillator now, we don't have to worry about finding a Green's function again. We can always use this one. Yes. We just replace one of the Absolutely. I've now given you the general solution. I've reduced the problem of the driven harmonic oscillator to an integral. Um, whether or not you can do that integral is another question. Um, but uh, yes. Um, now, if I wanted to consider a different system, such as the damped uh, harmonic oscillator, then I will need to modify the form of the Green's function. Uh, that is a useful exercise to do. Um, I prepared it in my notes. Um, let's see, are we feeling like doing that? How many, let's take a vote. How many people would like me to work out the Green's function for the driven damped harmonic oscillator? Okay, how many people would like me to not work out the Green's function of the driven damped harmonic oscillator? Okay, we've got a bunch of Green's function lovers here. Okay. So let's work out the Green's function of the damped driven harmonic oscillator. Uh, so here, uh, the differential equation that we're studying uh, 
see, I was all prepared to just skip this so that we would have more time to study quantum field theory at the end of the class. But, you know, um, I guess we're going to study driven damped harmonic oscillators instead. I'm only, I'm not even really joking about quantum field theory, actually. I have a lecture prepared on it, uh, if we have time at the end. Um, well, classical field theory, really. Uh, so, um, okay, for the driven damped harmonic oscillator, we are interested in solving the equation of motion of a damped oscillator subject to a driving force F of T. Again, uh, the, the homogeneous solution uh, is, uh, as before, when I was discussing the uh, damped harmonic oscillator. Um, and as you will recall, these homogeneous solutions all decay in time. So if we wish to study the late time behavior, then, uh, or the so-called steady state behavior, then that is given by uh, the particular solution. And so how do we find that particular solution? Well, that particular solution is given, uh, again, by an integral uh, from minus infinity to infinity of f over dt prime f of t prime times a Green's function t minus t prime, where the Green's function is a solution to the differential equation with a delta function driving force. So we can now, uh, so any questions on that? So to find uh, this Green's function, we just again uh, use the fact that for both t less than t prime and t greater than t prime, um, the, gr the, equ the driving force is equal to zero. The delta function is equal to zero when t is not equal to t prime. Uh, meaning that when t is not equal to t prime, uh, the Green's function is just given by the solution of the damped harmonic oscillator without a driving force, which again, uh, let's just focus on the case where we have an underdamped oscillator, which is e to the minus omega t minus t prime over q. Or was it a 2q? I seem to remember a 2q there. Did I make a mistake in my notes here? It was a 2q. You see, you can never trust your professors. Um, so e to the minus omega t minus t prime over 2q plus i omega prime t minus t prime, uh, where omega prime was omega times the square root of 1 minus 1 over 4q squared. That was the frequency uh, of a driven oscill of a damped oscillator. And of course, a general solution will include a linear combination of this along with its complex conjugate. So here CC denotes complex conjugate uh, because I'm lazy and I don't want to write it out explicitly. And so the solution uh, for T less than t prime will be of this form. And likewise, the solution for t greater than t prime will be of this form. As before, for t less than t prime, uh, we just wish to choose our initial condition so that g is equal to zero. And then we need to find the a and b, uh, which are appropriate uh, for g for this solution for t greater than t prime. And as before, uh, we impose two conditions. The first is that G is continuous. And the second 
is that g dot jumps from 0 to 1 at t equals t prime. So um, let's go ahead and uh, solve uh, those two conditions. Um, would you like me to go ahead and solve those or just tell you the answer? Let's go. Both? Again, this is a totalitarian system, but with a veneer of democracy. Okay, let's go ahead and solve them. <laughs> so um, at t is equal to t prime, um, th the statement that g is continuous just means that a plus b has to be equal to zero, right? Because all of those omega t minus t primes and omega prime t minus t primes just vanish. And so we just get a plus b. And the second statement, for the second uh, condition, we need to compute g dot at t is equal to t prime. Uh, so that will be a times minus omega over 2q plus i omega prime plus b times minus omega over 2q plus i omega prime. And that will have to be equal to 1 at t is equal to t prime. So because a plus b is equal to 0, those terms, the first terms proportional to omega over 2q cancel. And we are left with the condition that i omega prime times a, I'm sorry, there's a minus sign there because it's a complex conjugate, times a minus b is equal to zero. And so if you set a plus b equals zero and a, I'm, god damn it, is equal to one. Thank you. So if you set a plus b equals zero and a minus b to be, 1 over i times omega prime, then you can solve that and you get a is minus i over 2 omega prime and b is i over 2 omega prime. Just to check, uh, a plus b is clearly 0 and a minus b is minus i over omega prime, uh, which is the same as 1 over i omega prime. So the Green's function, to summarize, uh, will be 0 if t is less than t prime, and it'll be 1 over omega prime times e to the minus omega t minus t prime over 2q uh, times that whole big mess I wrote up above, you know, a times uh, the exponentials plus b times the complex conjugate, which if you plug all these guys in and you simplify, just turns into sine omega prime t minus t prime. Um, just using the identity that sine is equal to 1, is equal to i times e to the i theta minus e to the minus i theta. Just using the, what do you call that, Euler's identity um, for e to the i omega t. And so uh, this allows you then to find the particular solution uh, for a driv an oscillator which is damped and driven at resonance. Um, and uh, what I would like to do next is discuss a particular example of a damped oscillator which is driven by a uh, sinusoidal driving force. Um, this I will turn to next time uh, because it's an example uh, that's worth going through in detail and I don't want to have to rush it at the end of class today. Um, but before I end, maybe I should ask if there are any questions. Are you excited about Green's functions? Yeah. You should be. They're very exciting. All right. See you on Thursday.